Good morning, everybody. I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, wicked weather. Millions are waking up to severe storm alerts stretching across the country this morning. From reports of tornadoes in Texas and Louisiana to more than 80 million people bracing for a new round of snow. We're tracking who's seeing the worst of these storms and when people could catch a break. Major reversal from the White House when it comes to sending aid to Ukraine. The Biden administration is now preparing to send a couple dozen tanks to the country. All of this less than a week after U.S. officials insisted President Biden did not want to provide that kind of help. What this new aid means for the war in Ukraine and breaking news this morning about the additional help now coming from another Western country. Also this morning, a miracle rescue. A 22-year-old was missing at sea for hours after getting caught up in a current, but then was miraculously found alive hours later. All of it was caught on camera. We're going to talk to him and his mother, who was there when he was rescued. Plus, start your engines. NASCAR is celebrating 75 years of bringing the racing world together. We're going to have two of the biggest names in the sport, Jeff Gordon and Daniel Suarez, joining us for a look back on NASCAR's legacy. Excited to have those live guests with us here in studio. Yeah, big fans, so that'll be fun. All right, we're going to begin this morning with more severe winter weather on the way for several states. Right now, 80 million people are under some sort of winter weather alert this morning. And the storm hit the Gulf Coast yesterday with a tornado in Texas, reports of a tornado in Louisiana, and snow in other parts of the country. Now it's heading to the East Coast. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is in Indianapolis tracking the storm for us. Maggie, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but we have kind of like a, a rain snow mix falling right now in downtown Indianapolis. And as you said, this is nothing compared to what people in parts of the South are dealing with. I know it's been a lot to keep track of. Our climate unit just updated us. We have had in the last 24 hours actually 14 reports of tornadoes, largely in Texas and Louisiana. Multiple people injured in both states, close to 200,000 this morning without power. And then we're talking farther east, some of the first measurable snowfall to hit major cities this season, including New York and D.C., as this latest round of severe winter weather barrels east. This morning, millions across the South waking up to a trail of damage from a series of reported tornadoes. Louisiana hit overnight, leaving three hospitalized. Heavy rain and intense winds ripping apart homes and littering streets with debris. We huddled in the hallway until it passed. Residents near Houston out surveying the wreckage. Tornadoes injuring multiple people there, too. The back windows blew out of the house, and we just started seeing stuff flying past the house. Homes and businesses throughout the region in pieces. Cars nearly flipped over on front lawns. This house ripped open, its kitchen visible from the street. We had 15 structures damaged. In nearby Baytown, first responders rushing to help after a gas line ruptured and caught fire. And in hard-hit Pasadena, Texas, more than 70 animals were transferred from a shelter that sustained severe damage. The tornadoes also wreaking havoc on the roads with this semi-truck left completely sideways. Ways. And this transformer completely igniting and catching fire. It comes as about 80 million people across the country are waking up to winter weather alerts. The Northeast bracing for even more snow later today from a system that already struck the plains. Heavy powder sweeping onto campus at the University of Oklahoma. Meanwhile, in Arkansas, drivers cautiously navigating slick roads. And in North Texas, inch after inch of snow falling on the city of Amarillo. With the storm moving east, millions preparing for a new round of severe winter weather. And again, the weather just picking up now, as you can see, in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, we talked about close to 80 million people under winter weather alerts this morning. Also close to 37 million under some kind of wind alert. So speaking to the kind of, again, damage that we could see from this system that is just so widespread. And then again, guys, we're talking about measurable snowfall out east, in particular in New York, where you are. Our climate team says that Central Park actually hasn't had measurable snow in 319 days. So again, this would be a first for the season. That stretch expected to be broken today.
Lindsay, Joe, I'll send it back to you. All right, Maggie, thanks. Fingers crossed. Let's get more <laughs> on the forecast with meteorologist Angie Lastman. All right, Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Maggie's exactly right. We could see some snowfall in parts of New York City today. Whether it'll stick, I don't really think so because we have a whole lot of rain working in behind it. Some of that rain uh, already moving through places like Atlanta, Albany. You can see into Tallahassee, we have some strong to even severe storms that we're tracking. Already tornado warnings so far this morning. And we continue to see a tornado watch in effect for parts of the panhandle stretching into just that extreme southeastern portion of Alabama. Now, that system is going to continue to trek to the east, and that means that the severe weather threat through the day today, while it's lower than it was yesterday, it also moves a little farther to the east. So places in the Carolinas, especially the eastern Carolinas, that's where you're going to see the greatest potential for some of these strong and even severe storms by later this afternoon. We're talking tornadoes, strong winds, up to 60 mile per hour gusts, a lower risk for large hail, but still we're going to keep a close eye on that. Now, we've already seen record-breaking uh, amounts of tornadoes so far this year. 157 reports. We've seen 12 days with tornadoes stretching across 16 states, mainly focused for the southeast. This is the most active January on record for tornadoes, blowing away the average of 36 reports with uh, 157 so far this month. And we're not done just yet. Again, we could add a couple more to that through the day today. How about those winter weather alerts? They are. We've seen a couple of them come down, but still, uh, parts of Missouri into parts of Michigan, as well as into the higher parts or the northern parts of New England, where we'll likely see plenty of snow that will cause some trouble when it comes to traveling. Now, here's how it, it tracks through the next couple of days. We'll watch for it to impact folks along the East Coast with rain today. Uh, again, stretching through the Carolinas, we'll still have that severe storm threat. But it's the snow for really Michigan up into Maine that we'll see uh, be quite impressive in some spots. Now, the storm moves out quickly, but Maggie mentioned there's still some gusty winds possible, and that's going to be something we'll watch through the day today. But that west wind will also help us keep a few of those lingering snow showers, especially downwind of the lakes. Those will be around for tomorrow. Totals coming in anywhere from one to three inches for Chicago won't be too impressive there. They know how to handle that. Four to seven inches in Indianapolis, up to nine inches for Detroit. Not all that impressive either for places like Boston. Notice along the I-95 corridor, yes, we could see a few um, snowflakes today, but it's not going to be anything that accumulates really, and we're more so going to be watching for the impactful rain this afternoon that will cause problems when it comes to travel uh, for the commute and air travel as well. Uh, up in northern par portions of New England, over a foot of, of snow, so that'll be quite impressive. As far as the rainfall is concerned, one to two inches, guys. Those wind alerts will eventually come down as well, but it's just a busy day when it comes to weather, um, and not exciting either for New York. I, so I was hoping for some. Are we going to beat the record of the most days? So here's the deal. The 29th is the is it's in the number days. one spot for the latest first snowfall for Central Park. If we get some measurable snow, which could be a trace of snow today, then we won't quite make it there. But that's still we're, we're still in the second spot. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah. All right. No snow angels. <laughs> no. Rain, sorry, Joe. Rain, rain angels. Joe. Rain angels. All right. Thank you, Angie. <laughs> There's new information this morning about classified documents found at former Vice President Mike Pence's home in Indiana. This comes, of course, after classified documents were found at President Biden's home and office, as well as former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us with the latest on all this. Peter, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. A lawyer for former Vice President Mike Pence says that Pence was unaware the documents were in his Indiana home and that he is cooperating fully. But these revelations, they complicate Republicans' efforts to attack President Biden for his handling of classified documents. And they're also fueling new bipartisan criticism, with one Republican lawmaker calling the issue an epidemic. This morning, the controversy over classified documents is growing. A lawyer for former Vice President Mike Pence found what he called a small number of classified documents last Monday during a search of Pence's Indiana home, according to these letters to the National Archives obtained by NBC News. The lawyer says the documents were, quote, inadvertently boxed and transported to Pence's home when he left office, adding Pence was unaware of the existence of sensitive or classified documents at his personal residence. Pence has repeatedly denied taking classified documents to his home when asked by ABC News last November. I did not. Pence recently criticized President Biden for the act of taking classified documents after leaving office. The handling of classified materials and the nation's secret is a very serious matter. I can speak from personal experience about the attention 
uh, that ought to be paid to those materials when you're in office uh, and after you leave office. And clearly, uh, that did not take place in this case. Pence's lawyer says the search was done January 16th after classified materials were found at President Biden's home. On January 18th, they notified the National Archives, and the next day, FBI agents collected the documents. The revelations come as special counsels are already investigating President Biden and former President Trump's handling of classified documents following the discovery of materials at their homes and other locations. Now, the chorus of criticism from both parties is getting louder. You got Trump, you got Pence, you got Biden. What became a political problem, um, you know, for Republicans is now a national security problem for the country. Now that there's a systemic problem uh, with uh, former occupants of the uh, presidency and vice presidency having classified information uh, at their homes when it shouldn't be there. Mr. Trump defending Pence, who he has regularly attacked, posting, Mike Pence is an innocent man. Leave him alone. The immediate question here, will Attorney General Merrick Garland appoint another special counsel now for the Pence case? So far, Garland has declined to comment. Pence's spokesperson tells me that no other classified materials were found at the office of Pence's political organization and that Pence's team has not heard from the Justice Department, Joe, since it handed over those classified documents last week. All Joe. right, Peter, thank you so much. California has become the focal point in the debate over gun control after an alarming spike in violence to start the year. So far in 2023, the country is averaging more than one mass shooting per day, and California has seen just three since Saturday. NBC News senior national correspondent and News Now anchor Kate Snow is back from covering the shooting over the weekend in Monterey Park, California, and joins us with more on this. Kate, good morning. Yeah, Joe and Lindsay, good morning. Vice President Harris is going to be visiting Monterey Park, California today. She will meet with the families of the 11 victims who were killed Saturday in that dance ballroom. And in Half Moon Bay, California, the suspect accused of killing seven people on Monday will be arraigned today. He's been cooperating with authorities as the nation tries to process this wave of deadly violence. They lost their lives. Overnight vigils in Half Moon Bay and Monterey Park, California. I think the last two days, three days, have just been so difficult for us. It's very frustrating. Across the country, grief, despair, no anger. It was really hard not to cry because all I thought was, what is happening? What is happening to our community? In just the past four days, eight mass shootings, the latest leaving three people dead and one injured in North Carolina. According to the Robeson County Sheriff's Office, a suspect is in custody. Three of the most recent shootings in California, a state considered to have the toughest gun laws in the nation. But that hasn't stopped the violence. This problem isn't unique to our state, but it is unique to our nation. This has to end. It must end. According to the Gun Violence Archive, in the first few weeks of 2023, at least 73 people have been killed in 40 mass shootings across the country, compared to 27 at this point last year. That's any shooting with at least four people shot. There have been more mass shootings than days in 2023. One happens and then within a week, there's two more. We call that social contagion, where other people see somebody do that and then suddenly that feels like an answer for them as well. Nationally, politicians don't often agree on solutions, but the Giffords Law Center points to progress. In 2022, President Biden signed a bipartisan bill that gives grants to states for red flag laws, enhances background checks for 18 to 21 year olds and funds mental health services. 21 states and Washington, D.C. passed some kind of bill aimed at gun safety, though dozens of other bills in state legislatures throughout the country did not pass. I do think we're making some progress. It's slow, but I think it's coming. We need to come together and we need action to stop this violence. In the wake of the recent shootings in California, Governor Gavin Newsom and state lawmakers have been really vocal, demanding more action on the federal level. Senate Democrats joined President Biden in calling for new limits on access to firearms, but that is a non-starter for many conservative lawmakers, guys.
Um, emotional reporting there. Is there anything that, that you think about in the, your last few days there that, that still sticks in your mind today? I'm sure there are many, but. Yeah, it just, there, you know, I think what's hard for us as reporters is we've been going to so many of these scenes over and over and over again. And, and each time you meet people whose lives have just been completely destroyed and upended. Um, and you see really firsthand the power that these mass shootings can have. And, and just the numbers, the sheer numbers right now. Stop. More than one a day so far this year. Yeah. All right, Kate Snow, thank you. Thanks, Kate. The breaking news this morning in the Ukraine war. After weeks of deliberation, Germany has agreed to send its Leopard battle tanks to Ukraine. And NBC News has also learned from U.S. officials that the United States is expected to announce the delivery of its Abrams tanks just days after the Biden administration had argued against the move. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel joins us now with the latest on this. So, Richard, after much hesitation, looks like both countries, Germany and America, are going to send their tanks to Ukraine. In the end, why they decide to do this? Well, both sides ended up pressuring each other. Uh, the United States was pressuring Germany, publicly outing Germany, naming and shaming uh, the German government for not sending tanks. Uh, Poland was doing the same. Poland has German-made tanks. And for weeks, Poland has said, we want to send our German-made tanks, since we're not using them and they're very good, we want to send them across the border into Ukraine, where they can be put into action and they can be put to use against the Russians and the Poles are very worried that unless Vladimir Putin's forces are stopped in Ukraine, they will keep going across Ukraine and into Eastern Europe. The Germans had been hesitant, the Germans had said no, and then the last excuse that the Germans came up with was actually a pretty good one. They said, well, we're not going to send tanks to uh, Ukraine. We don't want to get more embroiled in that conflict. We don't want to potentially provoke Vladimir Putin if the United States isn't willing to send tanks as well. And the United States wasn't sending tanks. And the United States' uh, excuses uh, were that the tanks were, uh, Abrams tanks were expensive, they were hard to maintain, uh, relatively flimsy excu excuses. Well, it seems that the two sides have ultimately pressured each other, and now both the United States and Germany are going to send tanks. And Germany also just, uh, just a few hours ago relented, saying that if Poland or other countries want to re-export German tanks to uh, Ukraine, they can do that as well. So all of this very good news for the Ukrainians who've been asking for more advanced Western tanks almost since the war began, almost since day one of this conflict. Richard, you mentioned the fears of provoking Putin. How is Moscow responding to this news? Uh, they called it uh, uh, through a uh, through the Russian embassy in Germany a dangerous escalation. They said it was a, an abandonment of Germany's uh, responsibilities to Russia. Uh, so so a, a clear and quick condemnation from Russia. Which, which, Joe, is hardly to be, uh, is not surprising at all, I should say. Uh, Richard, how about the reaction in Ukraine to this news? I mean, do they expect it will have a big impact on the war? Um, yes and no. And, and so often when I talk about Ukraine, uh, you, you get answers like that, yes and no. Uh, of course they're happy. This is something they've been asking for, uh, but they want more. And, and they're not just... Uh, get it, you, accumulating these tanks so that they can keep them in the garage and polish them and look at them. These, these, this w weapon, these weapons are immediately going to be sent into battle. Germany said it will send 14 Leopard tanks. Uh, the United States is uh, expected to announce that around 30 tanks are going to be sent. Uh, but the Ukrainians say they need hundreds, 300, maybe 700 tanks. Uh, so they're happy, uh, but they, they want more. And, and they're, they're concerned that the United States and the West are doling out support, doling out uh, weapons in a piecemeal basis. Uh, and it has been effective so far, but the Ukrainians, uh, up to and including President Zelensky, and he's told me this himself, they, they wonder if the U.S. and other countries want to help Ukraine, why go through this charade? Why dole them out in onesies, twosies, a dozens at a time? Uh, why not just commit, send lots, send what they need to change the dynamic on the battlefield and not go through this, uh, what some of them have described as a, a striptease? All right, Richard Engel, thank you so much. I always appreciate having you on. Coming up already under fire, new Congressman George Santos now making new claims. Next, what he's saying about an assassination attempt as more of his Republican colleagues turn against him. You're watching Morning News now.
We're back now with new claims from embattled New York Congressman George Santos. He recently appeared on a Brazilian podcast saying he was the victim of multiple crimes, including an alleged assassination attempt. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the details. Another wave of shocking claims from Representative George Santos speaking in Portuguese on a Brazilian podcast in December about an alleged attempt to assassinate him. The embattled congressman also claiming he was mugged in the summer of 2021 in New York. The supposed assailants even taking the shoes off his feet on Fifth Avenue. Eu fui assaltado por dois homens, mas eles me assaltaram, levaram a minha pasta, levaram o meu sapato e o meu relógio. E isso foi na, na luz do dia. Eram três e pouca da tarde. NBC News asked Congressman Santos' office for verification of the stories and have not heard back. We've also reached out to the NYPD and multiple other police departments for any associated reports and have not been able to verify. The freshman lawmaker's early political career has been steeped in controversy, stemming from the web of lies he spread about his family, employment history, religion, and more. Now, forced to admit some of those statements were false. I always joked, I'm Catholic, but I'm also Jew-ish, as in ish. In one of the more bizarre about faces, he first denied performing as a drag queen in a tweet, but just two days later appeared to admit to dressing in drag when questioned by reporters. Yeah, I was young and I had fun at a festival. In the podcast interview, he explained his support for the Brazilian drag community, but in contrast said American drag culture is over-sexualized. Eu, particularmente, acho, acho o máximo é, a arte de drag queen, eu acho muito legal, divertida, mas eu sempre a interpretei como uma arte cultural para adulto. The openly gay congressman also defended his support for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's so-called Don't Say Gay Bill. Falar sobre sexo com uma criança de menos de 12 anos de idade, eu acho um pouco inapropriado. Santos has quickly become an easy target, with late-night TV shows piling on. I'm just in town to pick up my Nobel Peace Prize. Saturday Night Live offering up another portrayal. Proud to be the first African-American quarterback <laughs> to ever dunk a football. Santos responding by tweeting that he's been, quote, enshrined in late night TV history, but that all the impersonations are, quote, terrible so far. Even some Republican lawmakers have turned on him. He's nutty as a fruitcake. Santos responding that he is saddened by Kennedy's derogatory language. Clearly not backing down, he surprised reporters with coffee and donuts outside his Capitol Hill office. Donuts and coffee for all the hard work you guys do. All right, that was Ryan Nobles reporting. Congressman Santos has continued to ignore calls to step down from office despite growing opposition. Turning now to international headlines, Pope Francis is speaking out about discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Yes, Pope Francis spoke to the Associated Press today and he said that and he called all the laws that criminalize homosexuality unjust and called for Catholic bishops who support those laws to welcome LGBTQ people into the church instead. The Pope said that God loves all his children just as they are and that being homosexual is not a crime. And forces in Rwanda said that fi say they fired at a fighter jet from the Democratic Republic of Congo accusing it of violating its airspace. The DRC government denied the accusation and called the shooting an act of war. A video shared on Congolese social media shows a missile exploding near an airborne military plane. The video could not be independently verified. And let's go to Brazil, where a woman is recovering after giving birth to a 16-pound baby boy. That's more than twice the average of weight of a baby. So no wonder that on social media the newborn has gained the nickname of Bebe Gigante, giant baby. Still, he didn't make it into the Guinness World Record. The heaviest baby to survive infancy was born here in Italy in 1955, and he weighed, wait for it, 22 pounds, guys. You, you cringed there. Ouch. <laughs> Visceral. <laughs> Glad the baby's healthy, buddy. All right. Thank you, Claudio. <laughs>
enough said. Coming up, if you have been to a grocery store lately, you've seen the egg, extremely high egg prices. Cases of the avian flu have been to blame, but turns out that's not the only thing driving up those prices. We'll explain. Plus, 25 days into the new year, if you're still sticking to your resolution of working out, it is doing more than just changing your physical health. The new research on what exercise does to your brain next. Welcome back. Questions are now rising around the country's egg, big egg producers as the price of eggs soars. At first, the avian flu was being blamed for the price spike, but egg producers are now sharing the blame as the average cost of a dozen eggs hits four twenty-five. dollars 25 NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung joins us now with more. What's going on? Hey, good morning. Well, with reasonably priced eggs flying off of store shelves and warnings about smuggling cheaper eggs across the border, yes, that's happening. Buyers are scrambling to deal with this crisis, but people are now wondering, is this really because of the avian flu? Flu, or is this price gouging? You got them eggs. Ain't nobody follow you here, did they? High egg prices and demand have users on social media cracking jokes. But it's the nation's largest egg producers now facing the spotlight amid allegations of foul play. Advocacy group Farm Action has accused giants, including Cal Maine Foods, of working together in a collusive scheme to limit production and increase prices, all to juice their profits. Cal Maine is the top producer of eggs in the U.S., controlling about 20% of the market. Their quarterly profits were more than seven times larger than the year prior. During that time, the price of eggs more than doubled. In response to the allegations, Cal Maine says many factors, including the bird flu and increasing production costs, have contributed to higher prices. Experts point out that egg farms are not the ultimate price setter. We have to keep in mind that there are also um, other players in the supply chain, such as retailers, um, whose margins have to be factored into the final price that we pay at the grocery store. Smaller farms like this one in Orondo, Washington, have been able to avoid huge price hikes because they've also been able to avoid the flu. Cage-free eggs were actually about 40 cents cheaper than conventional eggs in the first half of January. It's delivery day today. We don't want to completely price ourselves out of the market. And uh, we'd just like to be a good, wholesome uh, supplier for our local community. Whether the blame goes to bird flu or price gouging, shoppers are taking desperate measures to find cheaper eggs, from raising their own chickens to smuggling across the border, prompting the government to issue a warning of hefty fines up to $10,000. But some positive news, the USDA says prices are starting to come down as the holiday bump in demand fades. Signs of improvement after an extraordinary year for egg prices. So in addition to looking at cage free, also check the sell by date and see if you can get a markdown on eggs that might be closer to expiry. Also consider buying in bulk and just sharing with friends and family and look at lower grade eggs as cheaper options. No smuggling, guys. No yeah, smuggling. No, we, we, <laughs> darn, I'm going to have to cut off that smuggling <laughs> operation I started. <laughs> All right. Very, it's what everyone's talking it's about right the now. the ones so. you don't expect. No, exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. A series of recent incidents at the Dallas Zoo is raising concerns about security and potential criminal behavior. This past weekend, the zoo's president described the death of an endangered bird as suspicious and, quote, not a natural death. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us now with the latest. Sam, good morning. Yeah, Lindsay, good morning. That vulture that died is one of 6,500 like it in the world. So it was an endangered species. Now, the Dallas Zoo is not saying much about how the, the vulture pin actually died, except to say that it was from some sort of strange wound. Here in Miami, Zoo Miami has no direct connection to Dallas or those incidents, but did show us the layers upon layers of security that they use that would have to be penetrated to threaten an animal. The striking death of the lappet-faced vulture named Pin landed hard at the Dallas Zoo, not just because of the outcome, but also the circumstances. What we found was deemed to be very suspicious, which pointed to this not being a natural death. That death, resulting from an unusual wound, according to zoo officials, comes on the heels of a clouded leopard escaping her enclosure on January 13th, prompting a frantic search for the animal, ultimately found close by. The next day, the zoo announced the discovery of an incision in the leopard's mesh fencing, as well as the enclosure for some of the zoo's monkeys, though none escaped. Then Pin's tragedy, seven days later. Dallas police are not ruling anyone out. They're looking at both people who work at the zoo, staff, and then anyone outside as well. 
So they, they're questioning everyone. On its sprawling 110-acre campus, the zoo says it has more than 100 cameras and it's doubled security. The officials haven't discussed how these enclosures might have been breached. These are considered dangerous animals, and there's various layers protecting this area. We're coming into the first layer here. At Zoo Miami, which has no connection to Dallas Zoo or the incidents, communications director Ron McGill takes us to the enclosures housing black bears in a Florida panther wearing masks because those animals are susceptible to COVID. How many layers of protection would you say there are in this complex? Uh, between five and six. Five and six layers for each animal. Just to open the guillotine gate to get to the bears requires two people. One person to open the handle, the other to make sure the lock is in place. So how hard would it be to compromise the structure? The bottom line is here, you'd have to make not one, not two, not three, not four, but five fatal mistakes in order to actually give animal access to escape or to get to the animal. With mystery enveloping the Dallas Zoo, that community is left with a sobering and sickening feeling about PIN. This is an endangered species, which makes him all the more important to long-term sustainability of the vulture population. And we're also really disturbed by the idea that someone might have intentionally done this. Now, both Dallas police and U.S. Fish and Wildlife are investigating this trio of incidents. Lindsay? And Sam, what do we know about the investigation itself and who might have seen something? So the scope is very wide. That's what we're told from authorities. And the Dallas Zoo is in the south part of the city where there's a residential neighborhood around there, Lindsay, which is to say that there are people living very close by. The hope is that someone saw something peculiar either on Friday or Saturday. And right now, there is a $10,000 reward for any information. Okay, Lindsay. Sam, thank you. A new study is out showing just how bad skipping your daily workout can be for your brain. And with cold and flu season well underway, doctors are prescribing a different kind of remedy for kids staying active. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Akshay Sayal joins us now with, with all these exercise details we're going to talk about <laughs> in the weekly checkup. Let's start with that one. The new study found even the slightest changes in your exercise routine can impact, impact how your brain works. Why is that? Yeah, let's break that down. So this was a study out of the UK, about 4,500 people, and they, you know, they took these people and they put activity monitors like like fitness trackers on them um, and they had them measure their activity while also taking these tests at the end of their activity or at the end of the period saying you know memory testing their memory and performance and things like that and what they found was that those who did you know only light exercise or those who replaced heavy strenuous exercise with no exercise actually did worse on the memory performance now to you know the big caveat here is only about a one to two percent decrease so we still need to see how that actually plays out in the real world um, but this is I think a great opportunity just to bring up some doctor's orders here the big one here and this is a favorite word of mine I just learned exercise snacks or activity snacks have you we talked about them a few days ago just like regular snacks <laughs> just like yeah well this I really like this you know it's you, you you sit for 30 minutes and then you walk for five um, the caveat here though is you know if you're walking to the pantry to grab potato chips it's not really working for you <laughs> um, so that's definitely something we want to try here you can, you can lower your blood sugar and your your blood pressure as well I feel personally attacked no Oreos <laughs> no Oreos or, or, or what's the Oreo Oreo what Oreo, <laughs> the no, Oreos no, Oreo all right so let's talk also we're in the middle of cold and flu season here and there's actually pediatric research that shows kids who exercise may be better off is this like a make sure your kid is exercising regularly and it, it strengthens their immune system or like hey you got the sniffles Go, go exercise. Uh, definitely not that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> make sure, doctor. make sure you know your kids are exercising regularly. What the data shows, this is a study out of Switzerland, or out of um, out of Europe, um, that basically showed that those who who are more active, especially the kids who are playing at least three hours of sports or exercise per week, tend to just you know they're sick less and they're sick less often. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't a direct like a causation study, meaning if you exercise more, you're not guaranteed to not get sick, but rather there's some sort of association. There's some smoke here. We want to figure out what's going going on um, but some doctor's orders here don't be afraid of the weather you know don't let don't let bad weather be an excuse okay. not to exercise bundle up and my personal favorite if you have a young child um, sports I think sports just be, besides this great way to you know teach teamwork and, edu and education and how to interact with other people um, so definitely want to try that for, for this reason but for other reasons as well just get that exercise speaking of exercise we know there are some people who who like to run not just because they like to run but but maybe is to sort of an escape from problems and that 
that a study found can actually maybe lead to bad health habits? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I saw a mug the other day. It was just running from your problems count as cardio. And I, I thought of a study, but, you know, the, the study is really going after those people who are, who are using running as a way to sort of rage run and just, just get away from everything. And th there's not a lot of positivity associated with that. And it can create what's called exercise addiction. Um, just like other addictions, you know, if you're spending less time with your family and friends to exercise, if you're cutting other things out of your life to exercise, that's something you want to be mindful for. So, you know, we just spend the last few minutes talking about how important exercise is. Don't overdo it. Listen to your body and don't, don't sacrifice a lot of other aspects of your life to exercise all the time. All right. Dr. Akshay Sayal, thanks so much for joining us. Interesting. All right. Coming up, could writing essays be a thing of the past? Teachers are worried that's now the case, especially with more AI technology. What schools are now doing to make sure it's actually the students who are writing those papers. Next. Plus, miracle at sea. A man is rescued hours after getting caught up in a current. His rescue was caught on camera by family members. It's now going viral on TikTok. He joins us with his mother next on what it was like reuniting after hours lost at sea. Back. Remember those long school nights spent writing page after page of essays? I still have nightmares. They're due the next day. There are new concerns this morning, though, that all that could soon be a thing of the past thanks to an artificial intelligence chatbot called ChatGPT. Stephanie Goss joins us now with more on what this new tech can do. Steph? You know, Lindsay, I just handed in all my papers late. But for those people who don't want to do that, this is pretty tempting. You know, it's fair to say educators are pretty rattled by this new technology. There are glaring ways it can be used by students intent on cheating. New York City and Seattle have already banned ChatGPT and its competitors on school devices, at least temporarily. But some experts say that's the wrong appro approach. These technologies are here to stay, and they're about to become even more powerful. Essays, philosophical questions, even therapy. ChatGPT is a computer program that will write whatever you want quickly and convincingly, and with better grammar than a grade school teacher. The big change is the existence of a paragraph is no longer evidence of human thought. NYU Media Studies professor Clay Shirky says ChatGPT isn't actually thinking, but using a form of predictive text, like we have on our phones, but on steroids. So if I say to you, Happy birthday, I baked you a cake. a cake. You know exactly what to fill in. All that data allows the program to achieve astonishing results, passing a graduate level test at the prestigious Wharton School of Business, managing a C plus on exams at the University of Minnesota Law School. The potential for cheating causing a growing number of school districts, including New York and Seattle, to ban artificial intelligence on school devices. OpenAI launched ChatGPT two months ago, getting billions of dollars from Microsoft to help develop it. The company writing, we don't want ChatGPT to be used for misleading purposes in schools or anywhere else, adding that it's working on ways to identify AI-generated text, which is what 22-year-old Princeton student Edward Tian has already done developing an app being embraced by teachers. We've seen like lots of teachers like try out and see like, wow, it works. Sometimes it confirms suspicions they've already been having, like of the students writing suddenly changing. Tian says he doesn't support banning the use of AI in schools and even uses it himself as a sort of rough draft when writing computer code. It's really good at getting me started, um, but at the end of the day, you have to finish the, do the job yourself. The powerful technology can be a constructive tool if used the right way. Shouldn't educators be freaked out by this? I mean, freaked out, no. But really, the answer is change your assignments to reflect the fact that you're in a world now that has a personal calculator for words. Students may actually already be using this. Stanford School Paper did an informal poll, and 17% of the students said they used it on final exams. 5% said they copied it directly. Lindsay? Stephanie, I can just hear you now with your girls. I remember when I had to write my essay <laughs> oh my, my God. hand up hill in the with snow. With my own brain. <laughs> I know. I, seem, I, I feel so old and boomery doing this story. <laughs> All right, Steph, thank you. All right, now an emotional reunion that's going viral after a heart-wrenching rescue in the Florida Keys. 22-year-old Dylan Gartenmeyer went missing after getting swept out to sea while free diving. His family obviously feared the worst, but after hours of searching, he was found alive. The heartfelt reunion as he was pulled from the ocean was captured on video. Oh, my God. 
We are happy to say that Dylan Gardmeyer and his mom, Tabitha, are joining us now. Good to see you both. Really good to see you, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, let's walk through it here. Basically, you went free diving, you surfaced, and you could see the boat was nowhere around, your friends were nowhere around. I mean, what went through your mind in that moment, and how did you know what to do? Yeah, so at that moment, once I realized the boat was gone over the horizon, it was just kind of uh, had to make a quick decision to either swim for the nearest reef that I knew that was there or just keep getting dragged further out to sea, and uh, I picked the obvious option. So you actually <laughs> swam to a reef, and that's how? Yeah, so I'm about a mile against uh, the outgoing tide and made it to the reef. Luckily, I found a piece of bamboo that had floated up out there in the deep water, and I used that so I could just focus on energy propelling me forward instead of having to tread water in, you know. I mean, your know-how, like, literally saved your life. But top of yeah. that, as a mom, I mean, you can hear the emotion in that video, by the oh, way. I yeah. can't imagine the worry. But Dylan had actually told our NBC affiliate in Miami that he had bait, there were fish, he knew eventually there would be bigger fish, yes. maybe even yeah. sharks. I mean, how worried were you? Well, I worry every time he goes out because I'm a mom yeah. and he pushes the limits sometimes and he loves being on the ocean. So every time he goes out, I'm worrying. But this is the one time that I got this call and it was just the worst call ever. Um, his father never worries when he's out because he, we have taught him how to survive. You know what I mean? Like he knows Clearly. Yeah. swimming, <laughs> keep your knife on you to protect you, drop the weight belt. You know, because there's certain things that you have to do to survive out there and get the buoys, the bamboo. Um, just knowing that he's smart really helped me a lot to get through it. Um, but you have that fear that comes over you and you're just like, whoa. My baby's floating out My there. baby. You, and it you, was the worst feeling ever. You got a group of people together to go out there. Dylan, when you see that boat coming, how long were you out there before you finally saw that boat? About three and a half hours. And, and what went through your mind when you saw them? <gasps> oh, man, when I heard that thing coming up behind me, I did a little, you know, shuffle and looked <laughs> behind me, and I was like, oh, my God, that's my grandfather's boat. That's insane. And that has the best feeling ever, <laughs> just seeing that. I just the best feeling for all of us like when you're literally going into the human ocean when i flew here i looked down i'm like how did we find my son mm -hmm. in that ocean like it's the vastness huge and we're sitting here going like 58 miles an hour full throttle through the canal and i'm just like we knew he was going to swim to a reef and all of a sudden something came over me and said just slow down slow the boat down let's look and listen and we slow oh down God. and my son is right there wow Right there. Yeah. It almost feels It's divine. a miracle. It's a miracle because how did we stop right by him? And he said, you guys swerved a little bit to the left. And he was like, oh, no. And then <laughs> we he's like, and then I seen you wave and they seen me. And I was like, wait, that's when you seen the whole video because it was all captured, the actual moment. Yeah. We, we got to be quick with you here. But my <sighs> question to you is, are you surprised by the reaction? And my question to you is, how soon are you going to get back out there? First to you. He already wants to go back out there. And when yeah. I seen his smile, it was the most handsome smile just to see my son smiling. And that was the best feeling in the world. We, we were watching that rescue video just now. You reached over and grabbed his oh. knee. I'm guessing you yeah. don't want to let him go. I don't. <laughs> That's my baby. Yeah. That's okay with you, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Dylan and Tabitha Gardmeyer, thank you so much for sharing and thank your you. story. It's just incredible. Appreciate you both. Welcome back, everybody. A big congratulations to Paris Hilton, who just became a mom. Hilton and her husband, Carter Ream, welcomed their first child, a baby boy, via surrogate. Hilton revealed the news on Instagram yesterday, and the post shows a really sweet picture of her son holding onto her thumb with the caption, you are already loved beyond words. The two 41-year-olds talked about having a child since they got married last year. They even started the IVF process during the height of the pandemic. Again, big congratulations. Okay. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.